I'm Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In part two of Exploration Science on the Road at the joint French-Belgian group meeting in Port Lacotte, France, I sat down with Professor Philippe Keharayan and discussed his incredible research efforts as a peptide scientist in France in the early stages of the COVID pandemic. We also spoke about his projects in oncology and his unique academic lab location within a pharmaceutical company. Maybe I'll just start by um, having you tell me a little bit about the research you do, just an overview. Okay, so we are working uh, in the field of therapeutic peptides, as many uh, colleagues that are here in the Congress, um, mainly in the field of uh, oncology, even uh, though a few months, a few years ago, two years ago, in fact, uh, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we developed a project on uh, a peptide able to block fully blocked the SARS-CoV-2 infection on pulmonary cell lines. So we went uh, on this, uh, this project during, uh, uh, let's say, one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, the peptide was active in vivo. Um, so the experiments were performed. But in fact, uh, it's always uh, difficult to develop a project uh, for, uh, uh, to distribute uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, product. Uh, in fact, we developed uh, what we call nasal spray, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was not that easy to develop uh, fastly the, the, the device, the sure. medical device. Yeah. It was a, a big deal with uh, INSM, the uh, um, um, uh, um, Cucup. <laughs> well, you've, 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 oh, yeah, don't uh, worry. No, no, the uh, INSM is uh, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, drug agency, the okay. French okay. drug agency, okay. similar to FDA. Okay. And in fact, we started discussions with them uh, in uh, September 2020. And uh, okay, they told us that our product would be a, a drug and not a medical device. So it was okay. hard to put it in, put the, the, the drug on the right. product on the market uh, right. very and fastly. This was a, a mimic of human ACE2, correct? That's it. In fact, uh, um, it was a fantastic period um, two years ago. Um, we must remember what happened uh, during this pandemic in France, especially in France. Uh, uh, we were, uh, our president told to uh, all the French uh, that we had to be uh, uh, in confinement. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the correct word in English. Anyway, um, and uh, luckily my lab was located uh, in the R&D facility of a pharmaceutical, French pharmaceutical company that is uh, uh, OncoDesign. Okay. And uh, we were able to go on working mm -hmm. and uh, to perform our peptide synthesis mm -hmm. and to develop all the studies we needed to uh, this project. And uh, in March uh, 2020, it was a fantastic human story. Uh, we started first uh, to uh, to product <laughs> uh, hydro high quality gels to distribute yeah. this uh, mm -hmm. these gels to the hospital uh, around the uh, yeah. Uh, we also distributed the uh, uh, masks since mm -hmm. we had a, a lot of uh, masks boxes okay. uh, in, yeah. our, in our group. Mm -hmm. We were uh, okay. We did this and then uh, we focused on the scientific problem related to uh, uh, the virus and um, they were two fantastic articles mm -hmm. that were published simultaneously. The first one explaining in science, the first one in science, the second one in nature, uh, explaining that um, uh, it is possible, demonstrating that it was possible to block the infection by uh, blocking the interaction between the spike protein and uh, the uh, ACE2 target, human target. And this was realized using monoclonal antibodies targeting uh, the spike protein or uh, also the um, uh, ACE2 uh, protein mm -hmm. was possible here to block this interaction. So this first article uh, meant for us that it was possible uh, to target ACE2 protein or the spike protein with peptides. Yeah. Okay. And simultaneously there was uh, an article from a um, uh, Chinese scientist mm -hmm. Uh, publishing the crystal structure of the uh, ACE2 protein uh, complex mm -hmm. with the spike protein. And this was the beginning of our human story. In fact, uh, um, this uh, crystal structure 
uh, felt in the knowledge, know-how we have in the lab. And uh, we decided to uh, develop the peptide mimics just by looking at the interface, uh, the interaction, the interface between the, the spike protein and the ACE2 uh, enzyme. Um, we decided to uh, mimic this interface with peptide, with a peptide, with a helical peptide, and we used here uh, algorithms just to design the, the peptide. So 320 peptides were designed in 48 hours. And uh, we started, I started, to perform the synthesis of the peptides uh, in the lab and uh, working uh, every day, every day, every day. And we were able to produce 25 peptides, uh, 29 MERS mm -hmm. peptides, very fastly using manual peptide synthesis. <laughs> At that time, uh, we did not have the, the uh, automated peptide yeah. synthesizer. And um, uh, we performed the evaluation of this peptide first uh, from a structural point of view. So uh, we analyzed the structure and we observed that our cal calculation were right. Mm -hmm. Some of the peptides we uh, drawn were able to adopt helical structure mm -hmm. in solution. And only these peptides were, these peptides were able to bind to uh, the spike protein. Mm -hmm. So we developed with colleagues from uh, OncoDesign, uh, Pascal Grondin, uh, at least. Uh, we developed uh, binding uh, experiments mm -hmm. using biolayer interferometry. And uh, here we selected again a few peptides that were able to uh, bind to spike proteins. And then we turned to um, the um, in vitro cellular efficacy mm -hmm. uh, of the peptide. And we were lucky again because uh, uh, one of my MD colleagues from Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital uh, had isolated the viral uh, the SARS CoV uh, uh, virus mm -hmm. from uh, a patient at the PTSR Salpetia Hospital. And uh, he was really happy to help us to perform the um, inhibition uh, mm -hmm. assays on the uh, pulmonary cell lines and uh, using the virus that was isolated on a French patient. And uh, we demonstrated here that uh, the the peptide was uh, efficient in a dose-dependent manner to block the infection on uh, pulmonary cell lines. And then we, of course, evaluated the toxicity of the peptide, and the, pep the peptide was devoided of toxicity at 150 uh, mm -hmm. times the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh -huh. concentration that was uh, efficient to block the infection. And uh, finally, um, uh, we asked to uh, ANSES, that is a uh, Agence de Sécurité Sanitaire, Safety Agency for mm -hmm. Drug, yeah, in France, uh, to perform the VIVO experiments mm -hmm. on uh, hamsters. And uh, the VIVO experiment concluded that the peptide was uh, efficient in VIVO to block the infection on the, these uh, hamsters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we published uh, our article, we patented the peptide, and we tried to develop the, the product, but it was not that easy. I mean, uh, I can understand why um, the uh, let's say the French government, I would say not only the French government, but all over the world, why it was decided to choose the vaccine mm -hmm. strategy to protect uh, the uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in fact, uh, these uh, vaccine strategies was uh, uh, held by uh, big pharma that mm -hmm. were able to produce the vaccines, to distribute the vaccines on large scale. And of course, uh, our peptide, even if for me it was the solution against the COVID because it's a virtual mask, it blocks the infection, uh, it blocks the uh, viral multiplication, viral mutation, viral transmission. Yeah. It's a virtual mask. Yeah. So um, it's a good option. I think yeah. it's a good option. But uh, I understand, of course, why uh, the vaccine strategy was right. chosen and not the, um, the nasal spray. Right. Uh, in fact, that was uh, maybe difficult to develop on large scale. Well, and so I think there could be still unique applications for it, right? It doesn't have to be a widespread application. It could go specifically to healthcare workers, right? Where a doctor has this. Uh, in fact, I do agree uh, with, with you, uh, not only doctors. Mm -hmm. We know yeah. that there are uh, a lot of citizens that are not uh, sensitive to the vaccines. Uh, I mean, sensitive in the sense that uh, they do not uh, develop uh, antibodies. Right. These are uh, leukemic patients, for example. Sure. And uh, yeah. Yeah. this is a solution for uh, uh, 
patients that can't be vaccinated. I think that uh, we need alternatives that are coming actually, and there are uh, many drugs that have been uh, evaluated for their efficacy to uh, uh, to block the infection, and uh, these drugs uh, has have for some of them reached the market, and uh, others will come, of course, uh, that can be uh, uh, inhibitors of uh, enzymes, uh, uh, such as, for example, the Paxlovid. Um, there are also monoclonal antibodies that are used in clinics. Uh, so there are many uh, uh, options. And in fact, uh, to me, as I told you, it was a fantastic uh, a human story. And um, uh, it shows that it was possible to work all together. I mean, all the scientists yeah. all over the world, it was very easy to discuss with our colleagues all over the world during uh, this, uh, this period. Everything uh, went very fast. Everything went very there was fast. a lot of really remarkable collaboration. Yeah, that's it. Because of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really fantastic. Yeah. And for us, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, became uh, very interesting because uh, uh, we had a lot of interview, like uh, this one, mm -hmm. and um, this led to the interest of many investors on our uh, project. Yeah. And in fact, my lab is uh, mainly interested in the oncology right. project. Yeah. yeah, we are uh, we focus m mostly on the oncology project, and uh, uh, we have here um, develop peptides that are able to uh, uh, induce selective deaths mm -hmm. of cancer cells. So this has been demonstrated in vitro, in vivo, mm -hmm. on many models. Yeah. What, um, what particular cancers are you looking at? Uh, in fact, uh, we started to work on leukemias, mm -hmm. and we have demonstrated the efficacy of our peptides on uh, leukemias. Um, the in vivo efficacy, we have also uh, demonstrated that our peptides were more potent than the, uh, the actual uh, standard of care that are used in uh, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, in acute myeloid leukemia, and other leukemias, of course. And um, so first, the evaluation were performed on the uh, cell lines, of course, on the lab cell lines. And then uh, we perform the uh, evaluation on the cells from patients mm -hmm. uh, at the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital. And we demonstrated, we, do, we did here a comparison study between uh, the standard of care and uh, our product. And we demonstrated that for all these patients that were uh, resistant to uh, the standard of care, uh, we demonstrated that our peptide were not only efficient, mm -hmm. but they were also not toxic. Okay. Yeah. No blood toxicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The selectivity was demonstrated. Mm -hmm. That led to the vivo experiments that were performed on uh, mice, mm -hmm. xenografted with uh, uh, tumors, human tumors. And uh, in fact, we perform here two kinds of um, uh, experiments uh, on immunodeficient mice. Mm -hmm. with human tumors and on immunocompetent mice. And this was really fantastic. Why? Because it helped us to demonstrate that our peptide induced a peculiar um, cell death, in fact, the, uh, an immunogenic cell death. Uh, in fact, during the death, the cancer cell will release in the microenvironment uh, compounds that we call DAMs for damage-associated molecular patterns. Okay. And these dams uh, activates uh, dendritic cells that will in turn activate T lymphocytes that will in turn eliminate the residual cancer cell lines that were not reacting uh, in front of our peptide. Mm -hmm. And we have also demonstrated that there is a long-term memory. I mean, two months after the first treatment that were injected to the mice, uh, we observed that when we tried to graft again mm -hmm. the tumor, the mice were resistant to the yeah. tumor. Yeah. So what is the primary mechanism of action? Because you almost have like a dual mechanism of action for these peptides. Can you talk about the primary? Like what's the, how does it actually induce the apoptosis? Yeah, of course. In fact, this peptide interact with a, uh, um, a protein located in the membrane. And this interaction uh, uh, trigger um, a death signal uh, with um, uh, a calcium dependent uh, signal, caspase independent mm -hmm. signal. So the whole mechanism has been uh, highlighted. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a calcium dependent, caspase independent uh, cell death mm -hmm. signal that leads to the death of the, the cell. Wow, that's, that's remarkable, that. the, uh, the, the long term. Yeah, it's, uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, 
uh, I, I want to say that this is a collaboration work that has been done between France and between Belgium, between Mexico, so different teams that have worked. And finally, uh, uh, the um, in vivo experiments were performed uh, at Institut Curie in France, but also in Mexico and uh, in Belgium also yeah, for this uh, collaborative mm -hmm. project. And so, so you've completed the uh, preliminary in vivo experiments, so now are you in the preclinical package still? Are you going on to, to more experiments? And, and yes, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Our aim, of course, is um, to uh, uh, to develop the, the peptide and uh, to uh, to perform the um, all the pre preclinical uh, experiments that are required. So the uh, toxicological studies on the uh, big animals. Uh, I don't say I don't know if I can say this because I know yeah. that uh, this will be problematic. Uh, but uh, also the CMC part and uh, yeah, uh, the CMC part is really very important. And uh, this congress. Uh, uh, GFPP, BGPM Congress was the occasion to meet all the, uh, the providers, mm -hmm. the peptide uh, yeah. uh, providers, and uh, this is great. Yeah. This is really great to discuss with all of them. They have really deep knowledge of uh, mm -hmm. this CMC uh, part that we discover, okay, we know what is CMC, yeah. but in fact uh, there is a difference between uh, the, theory, the theory and mm -hmm. the practice yes. of uh, uh, this uh, we are uh, academic. Mm -hmm. We know what is a CMC, but uh, <laughs> how to manage this? It's really great to discuss with all these companies. Totally. Yeah, I, I feel like I know. I know how to drive a manual car. Like, I know stick shift, but application? No, not so much. Yeah, that's <laughs> I feel. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, for this peptide, is it uh, a highly modified peptide? Is it just a native sequence? Can you, I mean, can you talk about that, or, or is it kind of a yeah, well, what I can say is that uh, I started to work in the field of uh, that time 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, in fact, at that time, uh, we were interested mostly by uh, uh, structure activity relationship studies, designing non-natural amino acids uh, to uh, restrain the flexibility of the peptide. And in fact, I saw the evolution of uh, uh, the peptide chemistry shifting from peptide to foldamers mm -hmm. and many other things, peptidomimetics, etc. And we were also interested by this, uh, of course, by, uh, by this uh, subject mm -hmm. during a uh, period of, uh, let's say, 10 years, during 10 years. But in fact, now we came back to uh, uh, our first idea that are peptides. And uh, all the peptides mm -hmm. we design are made of natural amino acids. So what I call natural amino acids, it's not only proteinogenic amino mm -hmm. acids. We know that there are 22 proteinogenic amino acids, but there are more than 700 no, uh, natural amino acids. And we use all these uh, amino acids mm -hmm. that are proposed by nature yeah. uh, to stabilize the peptide. So for example, a D-amino acid is a natural amino acid. So we can incorporate D-amino acid in our design. Um, and methyl amino acids are natural amino acid. We have this kind of amino acid, for example, in cyclosporine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is natural amino acid, and that helps also uh, to stabilize secondary structure. Uh, we use uh, norlecin nor also, for example, that is a natural amino acid. So many uh, natural amino acid, homotyrosine, etc. There are many. Uh, uh, natural amino acid, because what is important, uh, in my opinion, uh, today, we know that uh, we can develop almost whatever we want mm -hmm. in chemistry. Yes. Um, there are almost, I say almost because <laughs> there are almost no barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, the only bar, uh, the only uh, limit is our imagination, in fact, in chemistry. But when we think uh, to um, uh, the interaction, to a target and a ligand to this target. In fact, we have to think to the developability of the drug. Yeah. And in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, uh, it is easier to develop compounds, peptides mm -hmm. that are made only with natural amino acid because it's easy to provide uh, this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, these amino acids uh, for uh, uh, the farmers that are mm -hmm. the uh, providers, I mean, uh, for example, I won't say one name, but uh, <laughs> uh, polypeptide, Bachem, uh, Genepep, uh, and many others. Okay, many others. Sure. Yeah. 
to be able to have a resource that's yeah, yeah, not, yeah, not yeah, limited yeah. Mm-hmm. Because uh, so if you use a non-natural amino acid, I mean, uh, a synthetically made, uh, fully synthetically made amino acid, mm-hmm. problems of a uh, supplier can mm-hmm. appear. And uh, this will be problematic in case case of development of the of the product. So you have to uh, be sure that there won't be any problem um, from suppliers to right. uh, to synthesize the the final product in the uh, uh, GMP grades, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is really important to think when you have um, the will mm-hmm. to uh, develop. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, pharmaceutical yeah. product. You have to think to all this part. But right. before starting to design uh, your uh, your uh, pharmaceutical yeah. tool, you know, I was talking to Anna Maria Papini because um, yeah. she's been doing large scale, right? So she's doing like seventy millimole synthesis, going right. from five millimole to seventy, and and we were talking about the importance of at the research phase optimizing your chemistry. You know, so so I came from medicinal chemistry where they were like, oh well, you know, you just make the molecule that works and then the process chemist will figure out the correct chemistry for scale up. And it's like, well that's a horrible attitude, right? Like early on we can say what you're what you're thinking about. How do you optimize so that you know when I'm gonna go make a kilogram of this product, there's not gonna be a whole change in chemistry. That I'm ahead of time thinking of is you know what can I do that's the um, you know most green chemistry. How do I decrease solvent? How do I get the most efficient? Reaction? Yeah, of course uh, we are uh, ve- uh, very careful to these uh, uh, problems and the environmental problems yeah. around uh, green chemistry. And uh, at the beginning, uh, we used to do uh, classical peptide synthesis, oh. manual peptide synthesis, using a huge amount of solvents, etc., mm-hmm. etc. And now, of course, uh, uh, in the lab. From uh, on the laboratory scale, we shifted to our automated peptide synthesizer mm-hmm. and the same apparatus. Same apparatus. We uh, we have uh, we bought uh, uh, three of them now uh, in the in the lab. And uh, in fact, uh, it's true that uh, uh, it is uh, very interesting from this point of view. I mean, uh, from uh, uh, so for solvent mm-hmm. economy, for example, yeah. it is really, really, uh, really uh, efficient. Absolutely. I mean, uh, using this kind of. Uh, yeah this kind of apparatus. Right. So we are very sensitive in any way. Uh, I give uh, courses at university and one of my courses is on the, um, uh, the uh, développement durable. Je suis désolé, j'ai un truc de mémoire en anglais. Comment est-ce que je te traduis ça Tu le couperas bien sûr. <rire> Moi, je, je couperai rien, c'est aux états unis que ça va se, se, se passer. Uh, development. Sustainable development. Ah. Yeah, we are uh, very... So in the lab, we are uh, very interested by the sustainable uh, uh, chemistry. Yeah, uh, yeah because uh, in fact, uh, uh, I have... Uh, uh, I give courses at university uh, on this aspect. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, if I do not respect this part and yeah. uh, if I discuss with my student about sustainable chemistry, mm-hmm. it's not uh, <laughs> right. it's, uh, the good equilibrium. So we have, of course... Uh, uh, to deal with this in the in the lab, we are very careful to everything, mm-hmm. uh, to, uh, to uh, safety, etc. All this is uh, really, really. Uh, uh, we take ve- uh, very much. We take very much care of this yeah. uh, of this aspect uh, in the in the lab. That's great. So uh, shifting to uh, manual uh, peptide mm-hmm. synthesis to automate peptide synthesis was really uh, important for us, but. The major problem is uh, to be able to buy buy uh, the, the apparatus exactly. because uh, it has a cost yeah. also. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and you have That's to true. think. <laughs> yeah, uh, you have to think uh, to to this part, and it can be done between uh, uh, projects that are uh, uh, supported by uh, INR, for example. For example, okay. uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and also industry helps from the industry. Right. So we have many collaboration with uh, uh, industrial partners mm-hmm. in the lab, and this helps. Yeah. Uh, very much. Uh, and us. you mentioned your lab is actually. You said it's within a company. It's. Community. In fact, um, um, uh, I, uh, ten years ago, mm-hmm. uh, I had a proposal from a GlaxoSmithKline uh, pharmaceutical company, uh, who built uh, a new R and D facility uh, in the suburb of Paris, mm-hmm. a brand new, fantastic uh, place. And uh, this uh, this um, R and D facility uh, has been uh, um, bought now by uh, Onco Design. Uh, yeah, that is a French group specialized in uh, uh, oncology, 
And uh, okay, so more than 10 years ago, uh, I moved from Sorbonne University. In fact, at that time, I, uh, my lab was uh, at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, we moved from uh, uh, Ecole Normale and Sorbonne University uh, to uh, the um, R&D facility, to this uh, Centre François Yafil. Okay. And um, there were um, many uh, things that were, um, that were important for us uh, by uh, moving to this uh, R&D facility. In fact, um, first of all, uh, it was to learn many things from our uh, colleagues, uh, from pharmaceutical companies, because, okay, uh, at university, we know how to work uh, on a target, to design ligands, etc., etc. But we were not able to fully understand what was required to develop a drug. Mm -hmm. And just by discussing with uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, industry, mm -hmm. we understood what was required to develop a drug, and not only a ligand that binds to a target. And this was really, really, really um, uh, fantastic for, uh, for us, for my group. But there were also exchange, I mean, uh, scientific uh, discussions between uh, uh, the industry, and I think that we also uh, brought few uh, interesting uh, things to uh, to our colleagues. Yeah. So this is a very nice exchange since more than ten years now with uh, these uh, industrial partners. That's fantastic. That is the first I've ever heard of this type of setup, of a, and hopefully it's a model system for other companies. Yeah. Have, do you know other colleagues? That no. To be honest with you, I yeah. think that this is. Probably unique, uh -huh. uh, almost yeah. unique uh, in France anyway. Right. I know that this is easier uh, elsewhere, uh, in the, maybe in the United States or... Uh, okay. I've never heard of it. Where, okay. where, I mean, you know, you go to universities and you'll see labs that are funded by like Pfizer or, you know, some other companies. So you'll see like the, the name, but it's still at a university. I love this idea of having an academic lab within a company. I mean, that that's phenomenal. Yeah, I would like to... Uh, to discuss a few things with, with you, but okay, these are uh, confident, uh, confidential. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, um, uh, it was problematic at the beginning okay. because there is a, a frontier, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, between academy and mm -hmm. industry. It's not that easy uh, to uh, be a full professor at university mm -hmm. and to be located uh, on the an industrial site. In fact, it's not that easy. But actually, in France, mm -hmm. um, there are many laws that helps us uh, to um, collaborate easily uh -huh. with uh, industries. Okay. There are uh, many um, uh, societies uh, we call SAT, mm -hmm. Société d'accélération de transfert de technologie, that that uh, helps academic like me mm -hmm. to uh, develop collaboration, partnership, and also university, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, um, a group uh, at the university that is devoted to this uh, academic industrial partnership mm -hmm. and that, that helps uh, people, uh, academic like me, to collaborate mm -hmm. with uh, industries. Mm -hmm. So now it's easier. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, it was right. difficult. Sure. It was always difficult. Yeah. But now it's fantastic. Right. This is a fantastic uh, uh, partnership with industries. And in fact, this led to uh, the. Um, uh, we founded the four startups. Oh. Uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks to all this collaboration and that uh, these uh, biotech companies mm -hmm. are now developing the project that, are, uh, that have been uh, uh, discovered in the lab. Yeah. They were in the lab at the beginning, and now we hope that we will go to the clinics mm -hmm. with the, the project. Uh, what? When do you think your first molecule is going to go into uh, phase one? Uh, in fact, um, uh, I hope that in uh, one year okay. we will uh, finish uh, all the CMC mm -hmm. and TOX studies, mm -hmm. and uh, we will be able to address uh, to start our first. Uh, Clinical trial mm -hmm. phase two A. Oh, uh, in okay. fact, yeah, yeah, directly yeah. phase two A. Um, so in uh, twelve months, let's say yeah. twelve months, we are, I came here to discuss mm -hmm. about the uh, CMC, etc. with yeah. uh, my colleagues from uh, right. from uh, Bachem, Polybeptide, sure. Genepep, etc. Yeah. Et and uh, 
Okay. That's great. All right, one last question. Um, just this, this conference has been incredible. Unfortunately, I only got to see like a full day of, of uh, lectures. But what was uh, maybe one of the highlights uh, from, from the lectures that you saw that you were like, ah, that no, the, not one. There yeah. were many uh -huh. fantastic, uh, interesting points. But yeah. one um, uh, one point that was uh, uh, really uh, fantastic is that um, uh, I saw a lecture. I, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the uh, um, the colleague who mm -hmm. presented the work. But in fact, uh, he presented a slide uh, where um, we uh, we saw. Uh, the development of pet pals, mm. and in fact, on his slide, I was surprised because um, there were it was written short peptide, uh, long peptide, and uh, proteins, etc. Et mm -hmm. There were this uh, scale of the size of uh, yeah. compounds that were that are now now available that were now scalable, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, around the short peptide, um, uh, he considered that ten to thirty mil peptides are short peptides now. So there is a huge progress in uh, peptide synthesis because when I started to work in the field of peptide, uh, therapeutic peptide or peptide chemistry, whatever, a 10 mer peptide was very hard to synthesize. It was uh, in the 90s, okay. okay? So it was more than uh, 30 years mm -hmm. ago. And uh, it was very hard to synthesize, uh, not with automate, of course, yeah. at that time, but manually, a peptide of 10 residues and they were considered as long peptide mm -hmm. I mean, right, right. <laughs> and <laughs> thanks to the progress of um, mm -hmm. of uh, chemistry peptide chemistry thanks to all my colleagues uh, fantastic colleagues who worked on these uh, on this project since uh, the discovery of a solid phase uh, mm -hmm. uh, peptide synthesis and the Nobel Prize yes. uh, for uh, uh, for this uh, invention in fact there were a lot of progress in, uh, in peptide chemistry uh, that helped all the scientists uh, that are interested by this field to develop very long peptide now. Yes. So it's very easy yeah. uh, to, to produce uh, long peptides. Right. Uh, yeah. It is remarkable. Yes. Yeah, it is remarkable. And uh, I'm wondering if there is a limit to, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, food synthesis of uh, peptide and proteins right. now. Yeah. yeah. We have colleagues uh, like uh, uh, Vincent Kang here, mm -hmm. for example, and Oleg Melnik, who are fantastic uh, uh, French mm -hmm. uh, colleagues specialized in the, the synthesis of, uh, of big uh, peptides. I mean, uh, yeah. it's fantastic, yes. fantastic. Yeah, that's very exciting. Well, thank you for your time, and I really I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more publications, and when you get to clinic, I'll get the news release. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. I'm happy to, to share with you uh, our uh, projects. Thank you for tuning in to part two of the special three-part series of Exploration Science on the Road at the joint GFPP and Belgian Group meeting. Please leave a comment or get in touch if you have ideas for episodes or topics you would like to see covered. And stay tuned for part three.